So let's give it up for our host and panelist, Elizabeth Swenson. She is the AGPM Assistant Professor and has an MFA in Interactive Media from the University of Southern California. Take it away, Elizabeth. Thanks, Vicente. And hi, everybody, whether you're watching it live or watching it later. If you're watching it later, you can always come uh, to me in office hours and ask some questions about this, maybe in a future quarter. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts and hopefully this video and some others that might come up will help guide you all who are thinking about grad school. Uh, I'd like to introduce my fellow panelists. Uh, we have MJ, who's a CMPM Associate Teaching Professor, Vice Chair uh, of the Games and Playable Media MS program here at UCSC. We have Asikio Mendez Alejo, who's a developer at Tender Claws, uh, graduated from AGPM in 2018, and is currently pursuing an MFA in interactive media at USC, with an exped uh, expected to graduate this year. Uh, and then we have Chelsea Manzano, who's a production coordinator at Sony Santa Monica, an alumni of the MS program in games and playable media here at UCSC. So I'm very excited to have all these folks, a lot of slugs, whether we're teaching here now or we're here before. We've got some pre-written questions uh, that are common questions we get that we wanna give some general advice, but we will save at least 30 minutes for your questions. I wanna start with Chelsea uh, asking the question, uh, what was your main motivation for going to grad school and how did it meet or not meet your expectations and planned outcomes? Yeah, um, so I think my main motivation was that I wanted to learn more. And like, since it's like a graduate program, um, I used to be in computer science. And when I worked for a year in the Philippines after I graduated in college, um, I was in tech and like, it was like fun and everything, but I think I wanted to do something else, like something more creative and something that like, sort of like, tells like people's stories, tells like stories of the unheard and everything. And so I actually kind of wanted to go to grad school for documentary filmmaking, <laughs> but <laughs> things have changed. And I ended up in games and playable media um, just because like, I kind of wanted to use my background in tech and also like tell stories. And I kind of like encountered like interactive media. Um, and so I was like, oh, it's like the best of both worlds. So. Yeah, so I, I basically just wanted to learn more. I wanted a career path change. Um, and yep, I think in terms of meeting my expectations, it was like good. Um, maybe not, just kidding, MJ. <laughs> MJ was a program director. Um, but yeah, I think it was more than enough because um, the graduate program that I went to, which is Games and Playable Media, it's such a great program in, in terms of just letting you know or like teaching you what are the things that are needed to make a game. All of the different aspects it makes you do like sound design and like game design, programming, production, even though other people were forced to do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's very like, so one, it teaches you uh, what is game design or the different aspects that are needed to be able to make a game. And then two, it is very practical. Like we made a lot of games in that program and it was very like intense, I would say. Um, I think we were like, someone were making a game every week or like every three weeks so it was really fun it was very like practical very very hands-on so i think that really prepared me into like entering the industry to a certain extent <laughs> because others are just learned on the job um but yeah i think that's much it for me thanks chelsea and same question to uh Ezekiel. who i know is hesse so uh apologies yes. i, was, I yeah, hesitate yeah. for that reason <laughs> You can all call me Hesse, uh, since it's awesome. Um, so yeah, so for me, my one of my major motivations was that I've always wanted to teach and Elizabeth knows this. And I, I remember uh, bothering Elizabeth to be like, can I watch you teach? And can you teach me some of your techniques and so on? And, and that was, this is like uh, second and third uh, year of uh, my undergrad where I was just, I, I've always wanted to teach. Um, I've, I've always loved teaching and uh, that was one of my main motiv motivations. The other uh, other one was that I also wanted to learn more. Um, I'm really into creating and engaging my culture into into games. 
I wanted to see how far I could take that. And, and that really pushed me into figuring out like where I wanted to go, who I wanted, who I wanted to learn from. And, and those things really were the, the motivations that took me to apply to, to USC. Uh, and I'm curious, MJ, what kind of motivations do you see from your graduate applicants? Uh, what's driving them to get their master's degree? Yeah, well, so since our degree is is technically what's called a professional master's degree within the UC system, um, most of those folks are oriented toward how do I make this my career? Um, and, you know, Chelsea is actually the perfect example. Um, oftentimes somebody who's coming from a similar kind of industry, but not the same or is coming out of undergraduate and um, like, what are the things I really, really need to know to be successful? Um, whether it means going into some bigger studio, smaller studio, um, and some even go out on their own. So it's very much focused on this. I wanna make games. I would like to make that my career if I can. What do I need to know and do? And that's, that's, the, that's the focus of people that come to our, our program. And to speak briefly of my own experience, uh, as some of you, based on the poll I saw here, um, aren't necessarily in a games major, I was like you too. I got my undergraduate degree in ancient languages, specifically Latin poetry, speaking of like ancient Roman poetry. And uh, a friend kicked me in the shin, said, Elizabeth, you love games. Why aren't you pursuing that as your career? Didn't know it was a possibility for me because I didn't have programming in high school, for example. Um, but grad school was an opportunity to, be for, to refocus my interests around what I wanted to pursue in the future. Uh, so there are also some pathways for students from a bunch of different majors to make that change into grad school or vice versa. Starting, I get a number of students requesting letters of recommendation from me who maybe got their undergrad degree in games, realize, wow, I really wanna go into business analytics or I wanna go into filmmaking or I wanna go into this other specialized field. And so sometimes, grad school is a way to take the skills you have from an earlier part of your education and begin to point them and apply them in an interesting or creative way in a new direction. I wanna jump into the second question. I'm gonna start with uh, Ezekiel for this. What were the biggest differences between your undergrad and graduate experiences? And uh, what were the challenges to adjusting to grad school? So I think for me, uh, was the the definitely the um, um, focus on on my peers, um, an undergrad, and, and it's it's and it's normal, right? Like <laughs> we are younger and we don't have that focus. But I was also lucky to find friends who wanted to be in the industry, so we made sure that whatever we made, we had for portfolio my undergrad, um, and then for um, the uh, MFA. I, f I felt like it was more focused. Like this is very direct into like uh, focus and more uh, direct. Uh, we had smaller classrooms, right? The, the cohorts are way smaller. Uh, so we have more direct interaction with professors, more direct interaction with our peers. We are, we were forced to, you know, to, to work together and those, you know, figuring out ways to, to really move forward and create it, you know, every, every, everything that we wanted to make uh, I I try to make it also for you know for portfolio pieces, so try to push that as much as I could. Uh, and for Chelsea, what did you notice in the difference between undergraduate and graduate school? What were some of the pain points in adjusting, or parts you were really excited about? Yeah, um, so I think the main difference for me are like similar to Hesikio's, um uh, answer is like the people that I met um, in undergrad, like people. I mean, like my classmates weren't like as motivated, like so, some are motivated, very motivated that they know that, okay, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to be a programmer when I graduate, but some are like, oh, like my parents want to be a programmer. Um, but like for grad school, like people actually volunteer to go back to school to learn more and pay more money, right? So like people are more motivated, people are more driven, I would say. Um, but I think there's also, um, like a challenge where trying to find a balance between okay this is something that I want to make a career out of so like everything that I do here like kind of contributes to how I would position myself when I apply to companies after um and also just like realizing that we're all still students like we all have our own capabilities we all have our own limits and we all have like our own like responsibilities to do outside of this program so like just basically just like trying to find a balance between like one like this is um, something that um, I 
want to do because I want to accomplish something out of it, but also to like understanding that everybody's also doing the same thing. So like if there are like any clashes or like a uh, classmate is not like performing well or like classmate is like overperforming, like basically just like trying to find, like trying to understand where everybody comes from and making sure or like, yeah, basically like having empathy, everyone, I would say. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely does. And MJ, what do you notice in terms of students as they're just starting in graduate school, perhaps in that adjustment period uh, to where sort of they land, hopefully at the end of the program? Um, let's see. I'd say, and I know Chelsea is like, you, you can just totally correct me if, on this, Chelsea. <laughs> but um, when when we get started, like we, we start work right away. And uh, by that, I mean assigning work and and it's creative work and it's group work. And those things are often new to people, especially when they're maybe under a very short time frame. And that's, uh, I think that's intentional because that's what your rest of your time with us is going to be. And it's also what your time, if you decide to make this your career is going to be. Um, but I think it can be a kind of a, a big culture shock uh sometimes where like maybe in undergrad especially people that are just coming out of undergrad as opposed to coming out of work um i could kind of hide you know i could kind of like well I'll, I'll join when i feel like it and that's not as nearly as practical <laughs> when you get into the grad school some people still manage um but it's it becomes really really hard and yeah bennett's asking about workload and time management which becomes a big issue and i'll be honest has become a much bigger issue uh online uh, where people are uh, on both ends. Some people find it really difficult to engage and keep up, and some people find it really difficult to stop and are working themselves just into a um, really unhealthy place. And both of those things have happened way more during the pandemic than they happened before. So I would just caution anybody, hopefully this is irrelevant, <laughs> but if we end up in this online situation for any longer, like really be aware, I think of, of your workload and time management exactly like Bennett's asking. Yeah, I, uh, I can also speak to somewhat to that adjustment. For me, uh, in some ways it was a relief because I had switched directions that I went from, you know, I, I really enjoyed my undergraduate experience but I was engaging in intellectual curiosity instead of the thing that I was maybe most excited to do in that moment. And as soon as I got to grad school, because I had researched, you know, there are lots of games grad schools. I picked one, I applied to one that I thought would be the right place for me. And I felt very um, happy when I got there to realize I had made the right choice because immediately the peer group becomes a, a sense of, at least in my case, like there was a lot of camaraderie, a lot of support, uh, everyone trying to do the, the best they can and wanting everyone else to rise up with them. And the faculty also shared a lot of my sensibilities for thinking about creative problems and that research I had done to figuring out what are you know what are these people researching, what are they doing, uh, meant that I knew what I was coming into, uh, which that made that transition a lot easier. I know we're going to have Q and A's at the end, separate from our pre-written questions, but I've gotten one passed to me by Taylor in the chat, which is if you want to go into a completely different major and field um, for grad school. Um, how do you get in when you maybe don't have immediately relevant experience in that particular field? And I can only speak personally to this. There are many strategies uh, to make that happen. But in addition to being into all that ancient language, I had a substantial creative portfolio in writing. So I was taking a lot of creative writing classes in college and like a lot of people who love writing, just had like 300 pages of writing samples of just stuff I did for fun, including like fan fiction and all kinds of like stuff that was less professional, but could show quality writing. Uh, and so when I packaged together my games portfolio, there were no games on it. It was just creative writing and uh, a little bit of uh, interactive fiction, not in the way we think about it in terms of text adventure or twine games, but like stories, role-playing experiences that I had done with my friends that could show as a writing sample. And then I had, uh, because I felt going into a games program with no programming, I had something to prove. 
The GRE was optional for the program I applied to, but I decided to take it to prove that I knew math, even though I hadn't done it for a while, I was actually pretty good at it. And so I studied, took that test as like extra support, like, yeah, I haven't done programming yet, but look how great my GRE math score is. Like, I think I can pick it up. And so I felt like I was catching up a little bit, um, but I was lucky that in my cohort, at least, no one put me down for having to do catch up in that area. And I wasn't alone in having to do some catch up uh, because I knew that that program accepted people from a bunch of different backgrounds. So one great question to ask as you're researching grad schools is, um, what's the typical undergraduate preparation of your grad students? Do you allow people from different disciplines into your program regularly? Good research question. Before I jump, we'll have lots of general Q&A soon. I'm going to jump back to our scripted program before we go back into fun extra questions. All right, uh, starting with MJ, how, uh, so this is a question for everybody around uh, either how do you get letters of recommendation uh, or how would you advise someone to get or approach getting letters of recommendation? Right. So, um, my answer on this is going to come largely from the perspective of somebody who reads a lot of record letters of recommendation. So I'm the person who's primarily responsible for admissions for the Games and Playable Media MS, which means I read all of the applications and that means I read all the letters and normally that means three uh, per individual. So that's a lot. Um, and letters actually can I'll say this, they, they rarely kill you in an application because the people that you're going to talk to are usually nice, right? And if they're going to give you a bad letter, they would probably rather give you no letter. And that's good. That's a good part of the system. However, sometimes if maybe I'm not sure, the letters can, take, can push somebody over the line. So what am I looking for? I'm looking for someone who knows you, if at all possible someone who has interacted with you in the, the same manner that I'm curious about what your skills lie. So in particular, in particular, can the person speak to your soft skills? Okay, you got an A in their class, great. On a group project, I observed so-and-so always interacting positively with even the most difficult of their classmates, right? If I see that, it's like you're in, right? <laughs> so, what it means is try to find somebody who, who knows you well enough or who has observed you. It doesn't even have to be somebody who knows you, but who has observed you um, preferably in one of these places that isn't just going to be in your transcript. Because I could go look and see that you got, I get your transcript too. I could go look and see that you got an A in their class. But um, if they can say, oh, in my class, the person was really engaged. In my class, they asked the best questions. You know, those kind of things that I can't get from the transcript. If you have that kind of a professor, that's that's really, really good. Um, anyway, I could go on and on. That's that's pretty much uh, a good start. Uh, Chelsea, how did you go about looking for letters of recommendation? What was your strategy? Well, yeah, so um, I think, was it three back in my time, MJ2? It was. was. It three? Okay, I make myself laugh. <laughs> I just made myself like sound like super old there. <laughs> no, I'm not old, <laughs> not too old. Um, but yeah, I think it, so there were like three and the way I was thinking about it was like, like what MJ said, one, like people who really know you to like people who actually know your skill sets and your soft skills. And like, I think another important factor too is like, just like someone who will be able to understand and speak to how you're positioning yourself in your application. So for me, like I actually wasn't applying to GPM. Um, when I was applying to grad school in, at UCSC, um, I was applying for the Danum program, Digital Arts and New Media. Um, and so like how I was positioning myself there was, okay, like um, I come from a tech background, um, but I'd like to switch careers. And I kind of use, I kind of want to use my tech background to make interactive experiences by telling stories of the unheard, which is another thing that I'm passionate about, like telling stories of injustices, like sharing those type of stories to a broader audience to like spread like awareness and like maybe hopefully um, like serve as like a call to action type of thing. Um, so that's how I was positioning myself in my program. Like this is, these are the types of experiences I wanna make. So like in my process of choosing the three people, one, um, I chose like for, for the two, like I believe one was my 
college philosophy professor. And that would like speak to wh why I'm thinking the way I am now. Um, and then, and just like showing that I'm saying I did get <laughs> like an A in that class. So <laughs> I feel bad. But yeah, basically that was my, my rationale there. Like my philosophy professor knows why like I'm thinking the way I am now. Um, two, and then the second one was from my, the social political theater organization that I was part of in college. That was like the org moderator. Um, that like I asked her to make a recommendation for me because she can speak to the social political aspect of it and like okay like Chelsea has been in this like Chelsea has been interested interested in this and has been doing things to tell these types of stories since college and that's why she's passionate about that and then the third one was actually the um the CEO of um the company that I worked for in the Philippines I worked for a startup that was serving the Filipino masses through tech and so I kind of just wanted to use that and also like he kind of offered when I left the company so I was kind of lucky and very thankful for him to offer that um so yeah that was basically my process so basically some of my points um one like figure out what are you applying for like what kind of program two how are you positioning yourself in your application and three who are the best people that can support your argument and can speak to your skill set and like both hard and soft skills so yeah, that's pretty much it. Sorry, it was a long answer. <laughs> no, we have we have plenty of time. You're doing great. Uh, Asikio, how about you? What was your strategy for looking for and preparing letters of recommendation? I think it goes very close to what MJ said. Um, I was the type of student who would ask a bunch of questions, and it was it was genuine questions. I went and literally just really want, was curious about you know a bunch of the things that that my professor was talking about. And the reason, my main reason for, for these questions is because I believe that the value of the class is the professor, their experiences, um, and, and whatever they're teaching us. Um, so that's why I, I ask about questions, a lot of questions, and I still do in, 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 in graduate school, um, which also I think has helped me a lot. Um, but that really, really created this, to me, a connection with the professors and, and you know, I, I went to their office hours and asked more questions. Uh, so that process to me was, you know, genuine curiosity towards the, whatever they did and wanting to, you know, know how they got to where they were, they, they were, right? Um, so those questions to me were uh, super important towards creating this conversation with the professors. And I got a letter from Elizabeth and I got a letter from uh, um, Ed uh, Gregor, who is a um, um, Blender uh, professor at Santa, uh, Santa Cruz. And then my third one was a, uh, a friend, kind of, who, who we became friends after we met a, a GDC. We met in a, in, a, in a GDC party and we had this common interest on creating diversity in games. Um, and, and he is, he, at the time he was a telltale and then right now he's a Netflix, but, uh, we really created this connection because of the common interest that we had. Um, there's a funny story, uh, the Juan helped me, <laughs> Juan Morales helped me get that letter. Cause I was just, I'm, I'm not really good at socializing. I'm not really good at, um, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, very social, but, um, th this kind of, um, uh, interaction with people, uh, you know, with this specific person really helped me to, you know, get, to, he got to know me, he got to know where I wanted to be, what I wanted to do with games, and that helped him, help him write the letter of recommendation. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's, to me, is just getting those genuine connections with the people who, who you're asking the letter of recommendations from. Yeah, that's that's all really good advice. I remember back when I was asking for letters of recommendation, I was not as good at going to office hours as like, I saw I saw Hesse in office hours a lot. We talked about pedagogy, we talked about interesting game problems, like a lot of discourse made writing a, as a letter writer made writing that letter fairly easy because I knew Hesse in classes and in office hours, and I knew the kinds of questions that he wanted to ask. Uh, as he was going forward into grad school. In my case, uh, I was in a school that was smaller. And so the classes were smaller. So even though I was a little not as good about doing that networking in office hours, I benefited from the privilege of, privilege of small class sizes. So they kind of couldn't help but know who I was. But I ended up asking for two letters from classics professors because I was in ancient languages. So two people who I'd seen the most, had the most interactions with, many classes with them. And uh, they would have read many of my papers, knew the kinds of things I was curious about. 
uh, could represent my general work ethic and um, my potential as an academic, I guess. Uh, and then the third letter was from one of my favorite creative writing professors, um, because that's where I was headed. And I really was dependent on that being a good letter. And I would say that I didn't do a great job of preparing that professor to write me a good letter, um, but she wrote me a really amazing letter and I'm forever grateful for it. Like she saw something in, in me that I don't know that I had fully demonstrated, uh, at least in my networking ability. So every once in a while you do get lucky, but that time in office hours, that time working in professor labs or doing independent studies, or uh, especially the professors who teach you your upper division electives who have a chance to get to know your work well, make for the best letter writers. Um, I don't know, MJ, you think, I think you had some uh, a response to one of the questions we've gotten in chat. I think we can interrupt our yeah. order for a second to jump actually, in. Actually kind of both, right? So um, there was a question that had come up, like, what if, um, what if I don't want to do games? I want to do something else. How, do I gonna, how should I best position myself? Yeah. And I kind of will answer that in the reverse, which is because I see so many applications from people who didn't do games, but now come to do games. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Chelsea was giving some really, really good advice about, you know, positioning yourself. I think what Hesiki was saying is really good as well. Um, and, and what you just said. So lean into what you actually know and, but try to shape it into something that makes sense for what you want to do. So I'll give a great example. I, we just went through admissions. So this is fresh in my mind. And one of my favorite candidates, um, one of my highest rated candidates, got a degree in fashion design focused on shoes, right? And you look at that and you're like, what? <laughs> Why would you think you should do games? But you know, she, she made this very articulate argument over why games was something that's inherently interesting to her. And also why the design process that she learned was valuable. And then the letters also re recognized that and described, because they were, they were from her fashion design professors. You know, she didn't try to fake it. Um, I think it was like one math professor and two fashion design professors. And they described, oh, you know, she really had an intuitive sense of design process and how to revise and take critique and, you know, all these things that just made her sound awesome, even though she didn't have a games background. So if you were to look into, I don't think I want to branch into some completely other thing, there's still probably a lot in your games undergraduate education that's going to be valuable. So don't be afraid to sell that, I think would be my my thought thought on that and to stay in the topic with also these extra questions a question from rob what about letters from industry are they welcome uh like if you've had an, a position or an internship prior to coming into the program i'll let mj continue to follow up on that as someone who reads letters um definitely but probably if it's three only one of those should be professional and uh, i hate saying that <laughs> but i think it's true and part of the reason is because I just have this normalizing factor. When I see the letters from professionals, I, I like drop them down a notch because they're usually nicer than the professors. <laughs> um, they're more complimentary. And um, so you just kind of have to normalize for that. And uh, if I see like only stuff from industry and nothing from professors, that gets a little bit worrisome. Um, so yeah, kind of balance it. But if you've had an internship, um, especially if it's one where you can get a letter from a person you worked with directly, your direct supervisor, ideally, um, then I think that would be definitely something you would want to include if, if you can. And I think I would give the same advice. Uh, if a student came to me, I would say, uh, heading into, uh, yeah, a grad school program, one industry or direct supervisor and two academic letters is a fair balance. And it also might depend on what program you're applying to. Uh, professionals master's program might have a different opinion than a PhD program. Um, and getting a sense, like the kinds of, these are the really valuable questions that a program director uh, might have some advice on or can talk about common practice or potential uh, people you might work with uh, in that program might have an idea of what's valuable. Uh, you know, if you're going into, uh, an MBA program, for example, uh, maybe that professional experience is actually, you know, really important to have one letter that's in that category. Just depends a little bit on the preference of the program. Uh, but the also you know, on, on your history. So if you've been out of school for eight years, 
you know, going back and asking your professor for a recommendation letter, they're not going to remember you that well. It's not going to sound that good, and you're probably going to be using more recent. So, so that's a context that matters as well. That's a very good point. Uh, doesn't make sense to go back to your undergrad professor eight years later, in which case I think a committee would absolutely understand uh, that your letters are going to be more professional. Uh, which, so is, which is also my way of saying you can come back to grad school whenever you want. Like there, there's lots of opportunities in life to do that. Uh, let's go to our fourth pre-selected question and then we'll bounce back to any ones we've missed in chat and invite more from chat. Uh, and I wanna start back with Chelsea on this one. Um, how did you research grad programs and how did you figure out the differences between them? Yeah, um, so I like what I said earlier, I was actually trying to apply for documentary filmmaking. So I kind of just like went on the website. I, I was in Canada at that time, so I can't really like do a lot in terms of like visiting schools. Um, so yeah, I just did my research online. Reddit, I think, also was in there at some point. Um, but yeah, in terms of like being able to like change the way the the program that I wanted was I actually visited schools in Canada even though I, I wasn't planning on like, like going to a school there, like I just wanted to learn more about programs. Um, like I, I think I went to a film school there and I was like, oh, I'm not sure if like this type of curriculum like is like something that I want. So basically just like getting more information even though it's not the school that you're necessarily like planning to go to. So like at least you'll be able to know, okay, like if I see this type of curriculum, like I probably wouldn't want it or I really want it. Um, and then that's actually how I, kind of came across like interactive storytelling because I went to like a I think it was like an open house or something and then I saw like people in VR and they're like oh yes we're like telling stories through VR and I was like that's something that I want to do <laughs> so so yeah like basically just like trying to like even though you don't have like the means to go to actual like schools and like go to different states like I know like other people do that as well like I think the fact that you also like have this is already like a huge setup like you'll probably like do better than, <laughs> than what I did before because I didn't have this type of thing um so yeah I think just like being able to make use of what you can do to do your research would definitely be helpful even though it's not like a direct thing like just like being able to like be creative in your um research yeah that's it that's very good advice. How much for you, Hesse? Uh, how did you research which schools you wanted to apply to? Yeah, I, I looked into uh, game programs. I looked at the NYU. I looked at uh, you know many other Canada. Uh, but I think the I also side side note. I didn't know Elizabeth that you also uh, only applied to USC. So for me, it was also also uh, just just I was like if I, if for me. Grad school was, um, I guess, it was in my head, but it was never like, oh, this is what I want to do forever. Uh, just try to get to grad school. So for me, it was like, if I don't get to grad school, I gotta get to work, right? I gotta somehow, you know, make a living. Uh, so, so, um, to me, it was definitely looking into all the different schools, uh, trying to figure out who teaches in those schools, uh, what type of program or what type of games they they, they come up with. Uh, you know, and I, I was really into uh, experimental and cultural specific uh, uh, ideas in, in terms of games. Um, so, so that that was a big, uh, big one for me. The other one is, you know, uh, having a terminal degree, which in this case, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, USC gives, which is the one that I can teach with. <laughs> um, and then the other one was also, you know, what uh, professors are there? I think I already said that one. And yeah, who 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 has come out of those programs? And and can I point? You know, can I see their work? And can I can I kind of, you know, see myself going through that? You know, the, the 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 role and seeing what can I come up with after I go through those the, the, that same path. So it was a, a lot of that trying to figure out like where do I actually go? Another other considerations I also took was. Um, location right uh, also <laughs> cost of living for me uh, was a big one um i remember getting advice and not only from elizabeth like you know usc is very expensive so you, you you gotta figure out you know some way or another i remember also richard from march and told me it's like this is very expensive so you know i came to <laughs> usc with that mindset of like okay, I, I gotta make the best out of it figure out how to pay for things i gotta figure out 
you know, how to work or where I can work. Uh, so those things were also big con considerations to take in into, uh, for me at least, uh, you know, sc price, school, location, all this stuff was, was a big uh, um, influence. And to sort of spin that towards MJ, uh, how do you hope that students are doing the research before applying to your program? What do you want them to know going in? That's a good question. I would hope that they've they've looked around, right? I know that a lot of people tell us, that, well, this is the only one I applied to. Um, and a lot of times it's because uh, my friend told me, right? We hear a lot of that. Um, or, you know, I heard on some social network. Um, whereas I think if you if you look at and, and try to get in touch with, so so for instance, you know, we have somebody, we actually have, it's called, um, uh, what's it called? MS, just msgames.ucsc.edu, right? And depending on like who, who loses the, the Rochambeau, like it forwards to somebody's email who has to answer questions. And um, I say loses, but it, it's, it's like, we always are gonna answer questions and then we'll answer them directly. And it's gonna be some faculty member or staff member. And I, I would hope that other programs do something similar and um, that you could reach out to them and, and just ask a question. So especially like, let's say, um, you know, somebody says, oh, I saw this class. Do you think I should take that class if I came to your degree program, right? That's super specific. And it really helps me to frame an answer that will give them a sense of what their experience would be like. So if you can go look at their curriculum and say, oh, this class looks interesting. I'm gonna ask a question about it then you'll hear back. And I think that might give you a really good idea of, of what that program is going to be like. Uh, and to sort of lean into that a little bit, uh, one of the biggest pieces of advice I give to students who are researching grad school is you don't have to apply to just one, uh, but try not to teach it, treat it like undergraduate application is my general advice. It's not a send out your resume to a thousand schools. It's email the professors that you wanna work with because it really is about the people more in grad school. Curriculum is an important piece. You wanna make sure you're targeting your goals towards what you would learn there. Um, but because it tends to be a much smaller environment, knowing what kinds of projects are the faculty working on because that leads into the second question, which is what kind of projects will you end up getting some experience on or if there's financial aid offers, they're usually through things like research assistantship, which is working on faculty projects. So you wanna know who the faculty are and what they're doing. And one of the best ways to do that is to politely reach out via email to the people who you would want to be your mentors in that program. It does two things, make sure you're picking one with a good fit. And two, uh, they have seen your name before when they're going through hundreds of applications. So it's a networking strategy and it's just a good assuring fit strategy. So treating it more like applying to people rather than an institution goes a long way in grad school, especially for, P I mean, absolutely for PhD programs, but I would even argue that that's an important part for applying to professional master's programs. But uh, I saw, uh, Hesse, your hand was up. Do you have something to add to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember in my uh, capstone undergrad, uh, I, I was I, I specifically asked you like, how do I get my game to be in a museum, right? Um, and I, I remember you you gave me the contact or, or to, you told me to contact Peter Brinson, right? Who has put, put their games in museums, and you know I think that really pushed me as well into like trying to figure out like who actually who do I want to learn from to get to a you know to a point where I want to be. And that led me to actually also work with Peter Prince. And as a, you know, I was a, as a, 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 I was part of his research research team, and I worked with some of his games as well. So I think that that's a really good advice. I see a question in chat relating to this, which is when researching various grad programs, is also a good idea to reach out to program advisors before applying. Uh, and I would say yes, especially for questions about outcomes, like what kinds of jobs or what kind of places do students go after they graduate? Or um, is there a preferred way to submit a portfolio to this problem? Or what's the financial aid like? How many students take on student loan debt? A huge thing, especially at the master's level because uh, many master's programs are not as well supported financially by universities as PhD programs. And that's something 
that everyone should go in eyes wide open. There's a lot of privilege related to grad school, who is comfortable taking on that debt and who isn't, like big inequity problems. So look for programs that support students um, and have that more equitable sort of eye towards the program. And if you don't go to programs like that, know why. Why is it important that you do this thing first? Um, so program advisors can give a, a good picture about some of those questions, and then you can save research specific questions or curriculum specific questions to the faculty you hope to work with. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? I don't know, uh, Hesse, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, again, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, the cost, you know, the cost of the college was a big one for me, and it's definitely uh, something that I was intimidated on uh, right away, and it was very costly. But I, uh, one of the th one of the questions that I saw in the polling was like, how do you balance that, you know, the the cost of the college versus the you know the the whatever you want to go afterwards, um, and that to me was a a big one. And right right when I got in, I also I think Elizabeth, I also asked you like, how do I get money if I'm in like in grad school? <laughs> like how do we, like is there such things as like you know, uh, research assistance and and so on. So um, I, I applied to many of those. I, I did my research. I, you know, applied to a bunch of fellowships, a bunch of scholarships, and I, I got some of them. I still, I still in depth, right? But I feel like uh, personally, uh, I think I did get the 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 experience that I needed to move forward and really be, you know, prepared to either be, you know, to now uh, that I do both, I love it, which is teaching and professional, right? The the the, the being uh, indie developer, um, and those two things kind of. I believed in my case, and this is from case to case as well, right? Um, um, it definitely balanced out the of like, okay, I can now that I have these jobs, I, I feel like I'm confident that I, that I can at least pay, uh, you know, the student law within a certain time, right? Uh, so that to me was a big one because I didn't have like the 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 luxury of like, like I can stay in debt forever, right? Um, that I need to pay back. Uh, so that that to me was a big one in in terms of like, how do I figure out the, the cost versus the the whatever outcome is gonna, you know, uh, I'm gonna have afterwards. So I, I just wanna reach out to Taylor and Vicente. Are there any questions we missed while answering sort of our core four that we should get to and encourage people in the audience to ask? We're now in the open question time period. Yeah, I'm just seconding what MJ said. I, I know a lot of the students. Oh, go ahead. I apologize, my partner's on a meeting. Uh, Vicente, can you send questions to Elizabeth? Yeah, um, I was just scrolling up. I think there was a question. Did we answer the one where um, they asked, what's the difference between the games and playable media MS and the serious games program? Good question for MJ. That one's for me. Um, it's. Uh, it's an interesting question um, and turns out to be harder to answer than we ever anticipated. <laughs> and in fact, we've scheduled a town hall to actually talk all about this um, to UCSC undergrads. I think it's in about two weeks. Um, so uh, I don't know, through, through maybe through this uh, mailing list, I can send out more information on that. Um, the shortest answer I can give is uh, games and playable media is entertainment. Now that can be a lot of things. It can be AAA de game development. It can be indie game development, but it's entertainment. Serious games is, it's trying to achieve something else along with being entertainment. And I think a, a useful way of understanding the difference is if you're making an entertainment game, you play test it and you hope it's good. And then you just kind of put it out there and hope it sells. Um, if you're making a serious game, you're actually going to do some kind of research to confirm that what you hope happened, happened. I'll give you an example. We have two serious games that are coming through our capstones this year. Um, one of them um, is trying to teach a certain type of spatial reasoning. Turns out there's a spatial reasoning test you can give people. It has like the, you know, what happens when you rotate this block into that block, that kind of thing. And so it's that you do, um, a before and after, it's called a pre and a post. So you give them the test first, you have them play the game, give them the test after and see if they got better. And, you know, cool, they did actually, it worked. <laughs> um, uh, and then the other one is a game for health. 
uh, where they took a different approach, which was they made the game and then they went out, it's a game for physical therapy. And they went out and interviewed a bunch of physical therapists, showed them how it works, where possible had them experience it, which was really, really hard because it's VR and it's a pandemic and then got them to evaluate the product. Say, oh yeah, I would use this or no, you know what? You really need to add this feature or no one's gonna do that. I don't know why you decided to do that. <laughs> so got this very, very focused feedback from physical therapists, which is very different from play testing. So if that's, we're, we're trying to come up with the most articulate way of dividing the two, um, but I think that's probably helpful. Um, I personally think that the games for health part is super, super exciting. Um, I think it's world changing um, going forward, so. And I also see a question about uh, four plus one programs or two plus one programs, which I think is referring to programs where you get your bachelor's and master's or uh, sort of uh, opportunities to shorten the length of grad school by taking grad classes earlier. Um, I can't speak to those directly, um, but I imagine uh, as either an undergrad or as a transfer undergrad student, um, that might be an opportunity to think about also in the question of like how you finance graduate education. There might be some programs where finding a way to fast track that to have a heavier load in one's senior year, fourth, fourth year of college, because when starting the grad program, maybe that's part of the calculation or a value offer that they're considering. Um, I haven't engaged with those programs. So I don't have any feedback, but I don't know if anyone else possibly has. I don't know if we have any of those at US, UCSC. Um, I know that in CM and computational media, our department, we actually kicked it around a little bit, um, mm -hmm. which would be for the CM MS um, and decided that we didn't have the resources to pull it off. <laughs> um, but, it, but we thought it was a nice idea and you know, maybe sometime in the future. But you, yeah, you, you do have to get into that early if that's your goal. You, know, it really has, you have to have made that decision already at the undergraduate level. Uh, and I see Bennett, uh, you have your hand raised. Thank you. Hey, this is Bennett. Um, I'm the, well, I'm a couple things. I'm the AGPM uh, program manager. And I'm also, we also run the digital arts and new media MFA program out of my office. And I advise the grad students over there. So um, I think you guys hit a lot of the points, but uh, I really wanted to try to draw out the like big question. Uh, and Juan, our AGPM advisor, uh, Juan, you can chime in on this too. But I think when we advise students, and I think probably a lot of people attending are trying to figure out, they're like, I think I might want to go to grad school. I think there might be some stuff I could get out of it. And are trying to like balance it versus other directions that their life might take. And so I'm curious what, I, like for the people on the panel, you all went through that and you <laughs> you've all sort of told your story at this point, but you left out the part where you like wrestled to figure out like, <laughs> why am I really doing this and what am I hoping to do? And I'm just curious, like, I, while I doubt that any of you had like a beautiful Eureka aha moment, I would love to hear more about your struggle, honestly, because I think that's something that our, all of our students are going through. And MJ, I know you didn't go to grad school. <laughs> you could, that's the thing is you could decide not to, right? Uh, I'm happy to tell my story. It's a little funny, but I would love to start with, uh, how about Chelsea and then uh, Hesse's perspective on this? Oh, I would actually need a couple of <laughs> minutes to think about that maybe. That is perfectly fine. I will tell my silly story first and y'all can decide how you want to frame yours. So I mentioned uh, making a change. So that motivated me why it made sense. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine a world where I could go into being a game maker without some education or training and my undergraduate um, was not that. So for me, grad school was uh, an opportunity rather than getting a second bachelor's, which is also something some people choose to do. I was like, I think I've got enough training to work at the graduate level, but I'm kind of starting uh, not in terms of games literacy. I had the opportunity to um, be exposed to a lot of different kinds of games, but never made any. So grad school made sense to me. There were other elements of calculus though. For example, I was graduating with a degree in classics in ancient history in 2008, right at the start of the recession that had begun just a year before. So I was seeing where the job market was going. So I'm like, okay, 
I could choose to wait to go to grad school, but the economy is mm, yuck. Um, so I think that now might be a good time to be in grad school because my other options of trying to figure out what I want to do might not be as productive for me right now. If future Elizabeth had told past Elizabeth what her loan payments would have been, past Elizabeth might have made a different choice. And I don't think that would have been necessarily a good choice, but I do encourage you all to, to know what that looks like, depending on the program. And comparing that against sort of the objectives of various degree programs. We talked a little bit how, you know, PhDs are a terminal degree program. We often think about PhD students going on into academia. Um, but if you look at job calls in research and software companies, like I'm thinking of like Microsoft research and such, you'll see a lot of PhD requirements. So they're both um, industry related and academic related uh, trajectories for PhD students. Then you see MFA degrees, which we sometimes talk about as a terminal degree in the arts, and that often is re referring to opportunities to teach um, in the way that a PhD sometimes allows for that, um, and tends to be focused on uh, art making in addition to uh, writing. And PhD programs are often about writing a dissertation at the end, and sometimes also about a project that that writing is about around. Sometimes it's a game project for some programs. And then we have professional master's programs and master's programs that might lead to a PhD. So the difference between an MA and MS and a professional MS degree, especially thinking about games, uh, where they're trying to sort of prepare you or where they're trying to point you will be important to your consideration and researching there. Uh, I knew I wanted to make games and uh, I had no training. So that's why I went, went into my calculus. Hesse, how about we give Chelsea another second to think about that? Yeah, uh, for me, my aha moment was, well, as, you, as you've been hearing about me, just trying to teach, you know, right? Uh, but the other one is more towards learning how to, you know, more about game design, more about game development. Uh, although, like, I think uh, undergrad at uh, Santa Cruz gave me a huge, you know, amount of tools to to really get to that. Um, I felt like I wanted to learn more. I wanted to move forward and really figure out what is it that I wanted to make a change in games. Um, and personally, that was trying to figure out uh, how to tell, you know, like my culture stories into games. Um, and that really pushed me into, and, and then the other question, that I think really, really got me to really think about what I wanted to do. And, and not only in, 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 in um, you know, going to grad, but also like trying to figure out like what my thesis was gonna be, was one of the, uh, I'm gonna give um, the, the credit to Elizabeth. One of the questions I got from Elizabeth uh, when I was doing like my undergrad uh, capstone was uh, when I was doing my game within uh, the cultural, uh, with the cultural um, aspect of it. Uh, she, and I wanted to do a platformer because, like, I love platformers. You know, like, why wouldn't that be a bad idea? And making, you know, putting just a, you know a story of, about my culture in it. And she asked me, like, why, why is running and jumping gonna? What, what, what about jumping and running gonna tell the story about your culture, right? And that to me was just mind blowing. It just, I just, you know, I just walked out and just tried to figure out what, where my life was gonna be from. Here now, <laughs> but uh, that question really, really impacted me because I wanted I wanted to figure out well, actually, is there such thing as you know, can I figure out mechanics around culture, right? Is, is there something that I can figure out? Can I can I extract values? Can I extract something from my culture that I can figure out how to develop a mechanic, right? Uh, instead of uh, re recycling or reusing mechanics that we've used for the past twenty years, um, and that really also pushed me into figuring out what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, move on forward into learning more about game design, game development, to really figure out how to create a method or create something that, that I can help others, right? Because I, I remember in my undergrad, really getting really stuck with Elizabeth, like trying to figure out, like, how do I tell a story about my culture? How do we still, you know, how do we make a board game? How do we make a video game about my culture without, you know, uh, stereotyping or misrepresenting the culture? And that really pushed me to like, okay, there should be a easier way to go about this, uh, uh, or you know, like a way that we can all learn and and see if we can try to do our best to talk about uh, culture in games. And that really kind of I think is what pushed me into wanting to learn more, into you know, figure out how to tell better stories, or you know, tell figure out how to make mechanics in games. 
And then Chelsea, that decision to go to grad school or not to go to grad school, you've touched on this a little bit in terms of what you wanted to do with your earlier degree, but did you have an aha moment? Like, yeah, grad school's for me. Yeah, I feel like, so there, there were three things that time. One was I also wanted to change my career path. And so like for me, I know my limits that like, oh, I'm not really like a very good like self-learner. Like I'm not that motivated to learn things by myself. I really like, I, I'm the type of person who like is very trusting of people who are knowledgeable of what I'm trying to learn and guide me through that process before I actually go out and like do my own research and like expand my knowledge more on those things. So like, I feel like a classroom setting would be great for me and like, I think like since I already did my undergrad, maybe I'll just do my uh, master's program because like why, <laughs> like just do that like one step higher thing instead of like doing another um, undergrad. So that was the first thing. Second was, um, yeah, I think I was like living in the Philippines at that time. Like I, I, I was living in the Philippines for most of my life. Um, and so like I heard that like, if you go to the US and you try to apply for a job, because I'm, I'm a citizen here and also in the Philippines, um, if you go to the US and try to apply for a job, there's a lesser chance for you to get a job if your degree was in the Philippines. And even though like also, and if you like, even though you've had a job in the Philippines, like you need to be super exceptional in your job to be able to get a job here. Basically, that's pretty, that's pretty much what I heard. And so I was like, okay, like, what are the chances for me to get a job in the US? Um, and like, they're like, oh, just try to study, which is like kind of like the unfortunate like, like situation, right? Like that shouldn't be like a thing. <laughs> like job, like opportunity should be like better at least um, for everyone, very like inclusive. Um, so yeah, that, that was like the second thing, which is like a very unfortunate truth um, about the situation here. And then the third one was, uh, what was the third one? Yeah, I feel like, um, I wanted to do something very experimental, at least in my mind at that time, I was like very experimental. Like I have to like encounter something like that, like making like a game about like, or making an experience where you can like shoot people and act like, like, <laughs> like so basically just a little bit of background on what I did in grad school. Um, we made a VR experience about the Philippine drug war that was happening or is still happening in the Philippines. Um, as a result of like the new president being elected and like him like being like super opposed to like drugs and his only ways to like kill people, you know, like there isn't like a system for it. Um, so I kind of wanted to tell that story and through like a game or an experience in VR because I want I want the I want the people to experience it in VR at least like they they can't be in the Philippines, but at least they can like feel it like because like VR is different than like just using your PC and like, you know, like clicking and stuff, like you're in that world. So, so that's what I did. And like, it felt like it was like something very experimental that going to school for it is good because you can be experimental and you can do like lots of different things and you can like, like not just like stick to what the industry is all is already like dictating for you to do. So yeah, I, I feel like those, those were my three main things. Yep. One piece of advice I sometimes give students is uh, if grad school seems like it could be the right path for you, um, having a really focused idea of what you want to do with that time uh, helps frame a good admission package. Even if like part of you is like, yeah, I, I really want some just more time getting used to this game engine, or I really want to have more opportunities to make more games. Uh, that's often what I hear from students who come to my office, but being specific about like, what is your vision, especially from a design perspective? What do you have to bring to game design? And why is this program in specific, you know, specifically that I'm applying to the one where I can do that? Uh, and that lets the people reading those applications on the other net and know like exactly the kinds of projects you're interested in making. And also that you've done some research in the individual schools that you're applying for. And that it's not just a general, like I wanna be better at this skill um, from a training perspective. Now, there might be some programs that don't mind that kind of application, but I think you'll notice that most programs will look at students that have specific goals uh, uh, at a higher level than those who are, have more general goals. But MJ, you also read a lot of applications. What, what do you think about uh, that choice of going to grad school to figure out what you want to do versus coming in with a plan? 
Uh, you know, I, this is going to sound really maybe silly, but a lot of people articulate that they want to kind of figure out who they are. Mm. Um, and that's often a really compelling application if it mm -hmm. feels like they're ready for that. Um, and this is, you know, am I, am I really, is this something I really, really want to do with my life? And I think it is, and here's the work I've done to prepare and et cetera, but um, you know, that, is that it? Uh, and, and I think that's a valid question for someone entering um, grad school uh, and especially at the master's level. So I don't know that uh, there's lots of different, I was gonna say earlier, like people, re people remember stories and mm -hmm. a grad school application is a story and so I remember the story of the person who designs shoes <laughs> and I'm never gonna forget that story. Uh, and so being honest with your story um, is like the best thing you can do, uh, whatever that story may be. Uh, and, and honestly, probably the process of formulating that story in an application should be, should be nourishing and helpful for you, you know, whether that's, this is really the right thing for you. That's, that's helpful because sometimes I worry about um, students who come to, for advisement around grad school of wanting to use graduate school to figure things out because, you know, part of my, my, my brain goes, that's a very expensive way to figure out what you want to do. <laughs> Is there another way where you could figure out what you want to do and then dive headfirst into that thing? Um, but I can't speak for what everyone needs at a given moment. And I'm sure there's a group of people for whom that's very important. Um, what I'll say is I went into grad school thinking I knew exactly what I wanted to do. It's like, uh, even though I applied to other grad programs in the field I was studying at the time, in my brain, I was going, I don't want to be a professor. I want to be a game writer at an indie game studio. Guess where I ended up? <laughs> I ended up as a professor anyway. Uh, so just because you have a goal doesn't mean it has to be the goal you end grad school with. That's true. You know, the experiences of your graduate ex you know, program might open your eyes to def different ways to sort of plan out your future. Um, but it's, I find it helpful when I'm re reviewing, especially for short programs, like this is who I am. This is what I've made. This is what I think I'm going to do. I'm never going to hold an applicant to, well, did they make that project they proposed? But seeing that they have an idea of their next step uh, is helpful to me sometimes on an admissions committee. Hey, Elizabeth, do you mind if I jump back in just for one second? Yeah, come in. Just putting my Danum uh, grad student advisor cap on. And I just wanted to reflect back like those, thank you all for t addressing my question and like one thing, I think this last point about when I heard you say, Elizabeth, like, I want to get better at a skill. Uh, to me, I get, I hear that from applicants to the digital arts new media program. And, you know, I just try to say, well, from a big picture perspective, this program isn't about teaching you skills. It's about teaching you how to be an artist and about teaching you how to pursue big ideas and figure out how you want to express those. And I heard that really clearly, both from Hesse and Chelsea, right? Like I heard both of you say, well, there was a mix of very practical things in my life, financial considerations, the timing of where I was in my career and where I was living, like all these really practical considerations. But then you both had this thing where you're like, but there's this idea that I'm grappling with or this question that was sitting with me that was really engaging. And I felt like school would be the place to like explore that. Other people might come out of undergrad feeling like, there's not a big idea, they more want to be like, well, I want to get better at this skill, or I want to like, hey, I really loved working on this thing on my capstone project. I wonder if I could get an, I could get a job in the industry where I could do that again and get really good at that and probably generate a lot of ideas, you know, uh, as MJ said, like, we have returning students in the digital arts new media program. And it's often people that have like worked in an industry for a while and over time, got more clarity about the thing, so or something changed in their life practically too, right? And they might've had some idea about what's this, what's this big idea or this question that I'm interested in engaging with and figuring out myself. And then they came back to grad school. So I think, um, thank you all. I think you really, your, your stories all reflect that uh, the nuances of it. So thanks for, thanks for sharing. Any other questions from the audience? I can certainly talk about a bunch of random things and I'm sure other people on the panel have uh, some other guidance or thoughts. 
uh, about going to grad school. I'll start with one nonsense one, you know, as he was talking about the concern around like living expenses, where is this place? What are some other aspects of the context of location? My silly contribution to that is my undergrad was in the Pacific Northwest and I knew I could not stand a rainy environment any longer. So any internships, job opportunities and schools where it rained most of the year were just immediately off my list. Semi-arbitrarily, but not really. Thinking about how and where you're gonna live is another part of graduate school, especially PhD programs, which are a little longer. Uh, I went to LA to just kind of dry out. Uh, and plus it was a program that fit what I wanted to do very well. <laughs> I think it might be useful just to talk through like the the differences between the different degrees. Yeah, we've kind of enumerated them, but like, you know, okay, so there's this sort of traditional MS, there's a S slash MA, there's professional MS and sometimes MA, um, MFA, PhD, right? And these are all different. Um, and one of the big differences you were just referencing is time scale. Yeah. You know, so PhD is great. It's also takes a really long time. You know, five to six years kind of is the norm. And in, in the U.S., I should say that uh, yeah, okay. international PhD programs are a little shorter. Okay, then go 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 international, I guess. <laughs> um, but you know, the 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 uh, the goal is very different. You know, in the PhD, uh, you're you're there to advance the field. Like you don't get to get the degree until you have done something that advances the field in some meaningful way. Um, Whereas the the MS, let's say, in the exact same field, and you know, for me that would be computational media that I'm, I'm familiar with, is you do a capstone, um, and that's a thesis, but it's not necessarily like advancing the state of the art in the same way as a PhD would be, and you don't have to write a 300-page dissertation. <laughs> um, so it's it's just like the 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 level of commitment is like a whole quantum higher for PhD. On the other hand, PhD qualifies you for a lot of things that the other degrees don't. And you know, you're referencing MFA as well as a, as a so-called terminal degree. Um, so for teaching, super, super helpful. Um, within certain other realms, like I, was, I put in the chat, but like Google loves to hire PhDs. They just love to hire PhDs. You're, you're mentioning Microsoft Research, again, love to hire PhDs. And then all of academia expects a terminal degree. So um, yeah, it's, it's very, very different. And, and for us on the professional MS, like we're on a very, very rigid schedule. You're gonna enter on this date, you're gonna exit on this date, and then you're done and you'll have the degree as long as you didn't screw up. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, really different in terms of what that experience looks like. And to speak to sort of MFA, it's not in between those things, but they tend to be shorter. Um, they're often two or three years long. Right. But they have a little bit of the formality, like a, a small version of what you might see in the process of getting a PhD in that MFAs often have a defense, a moment where you have to defend your work in front of a committee that you have curated. And the success or failure of that defense is tied directly into being awarded the degree. Uh, and sometimes that's a defense of a project and a paper. Um, sometimes it's a defense of just a paper, even if there is a project. And figuring out exactly how that um, process works for the institution you're looking at and whether that's what you're looking for is important versus uh, an MA or an MS. And we keep talking about professional and uh, a more traditional version of those. Um, to speak briefly about the more traditional form, that's sometimes considered a first step maybe towards a PhD, uh, that you um, might get your MA from one program and then decide to get your PhD somewhere else, but often, or in some programs, there's an expectation of continuation. And similarly, in some PhD programs, there's a chance to like stop at the master's level equivalency of achievement and go, actually, I'm good with this, and I'm choosing not to pursue the PhD. Um, that's maybe a little rarer, but I have heard of instances of that happening versus a professional master's program is looking towards a connection typically to an industry um, and has objectives there um, and maybe not have something like a, a thesis defense. Um, Bennett asks in chat more detail about approaching letter of rec writers, how to cultivate relationships with professors uh, or professional contracts and timing. Um, so we talked a little bit about you want to make sure it's someone who knows you, who can speak to your hard skills and soft skills. 
for UCSC students, I recommend professors you've had independent studies with, you've worked on their research, or you've had small courses with them. And by small, I mean like, you know, when we talk small, we're talking like 30 people at UCSC because that's the kind of sizes we're dealing with. Um, professors that have taught you in like a 200 person classroom, they could be a good letter writer if you were the kind of student that was in office hours a lot, that you asked questions a lot, they knew who you were and gave you a lot of sort of back and forth around your project or uh, paperwork. Um, but in general, the ones you know best and starting to think about reaching out and going to office hours more often uh, can be a helpful way to get to know each other. Anyone else have advice on cultivating those relationships or overcoming sometimes the trepidation that I, students have about going to office hours or asking those questions? I know that sometimes that's scary. Um, yeah, I think I can talk about how to start approaching uh, professors. I think, yeah, so I started actually uh, back in community college doing this. Um, it was something that I, I was, I, I've always been afraid of asking things before, before I actually got the confidence to do it. Um, but it was not until I really was struggling with a math class. I, I mean, I failed it twice. I was like, okay, how do I, not, I need to pass it, right? <laughs> it's like, how do I, I need to ask people how to do this thing? Um, and that was to me, the thing that, that pushed me into doing this. Cause like, otherwise I, I'm very shy. I'm, I'm very not, I was not confident at all because I was like, I don't know what, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Uh, so that really pushed me into asking questions and 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 right there uh the professor who was teaching me math asked, uh, told me like all right i'm gonna recommend you to teach math i was like what i'm 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 not good at math why would you do that <laughs> and 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 th th she said that the best way to learn was to 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 teach it right um and to really if you really understand it then you can teach it and so i i had to force myself into really understand it and that teaching little, uh, you know, tutoring a little bit really got me to talk to people, right? That that really uh, made me empathize, empathize with other people. And, and I, I would tell them like, you know, I, I failed math and I'm, and I'm here trying to tutor you. And then they would also empathize with me. So trying to figure out like, you know, to me is understanding that we are all people. <laughs> we all have issues, we all have problems. And, and you know, that to me, uh, really helped me trying to, you know, trying to talk to other people uh, and, 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 you know, getting to understand that they, they also probably want at some point were scared of talking to other people. Um, so, so that to me really helped me. Um, so little by little, I got used to talking to professors, talking to other people and really pushing my comfort zone of like, I don't need to talk to people, but it was, it was really that, you know, necessity of like, I need to, I need to pass this class. <laughs> so that really got me to start talking to other people. Uh, I want to add to that too. Like I'm a very shy student or I was <laughs> um, like, I, I, I don't know if MJ knows this or he even like um, observed it when, when he was my professor, but I never like, I'm the kind of student um that never like speaks in class like whenever like there's like recitation I don't raise my hand I don't like volunteer myself to speak in front of everyone um I also don't go to like or I didn't go to like office hours just because I'm super like shy like I'm like what am I supposed to talk about ah! um but yeah I, I'm I don't know if MJ noticed that because in grad school we were we I think at some point we had that like randomizer and like it would like randomly choose a person and I'm like oh my gosh I think I'm gonna pass out <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so basically that's that was the type of person that I was when, when I was in college I think I still I, I still am very shy um so like what I did was like um using the philosophy professor as an example like he probably wouldn't know me <laughs> if I didn't do this as well um like like the branch of philosophy that he was teaching us really interested me 
like it was like very like interesting to me that I really wanted to like get more book re recommendations or like hey do you have like any other like readings they would suggest me to do so I would do that in email form so at least it's like a first step to like like make an impression and showing the professor that hey like I'm very interested in what you're teaching us like is there anything else that I can do to broaden my knowledge on this one um and I think that kind of like cultivated my relationship with that professor in terms of just like making myself know that, hey, like there's something that I'm interested in. And also to like, um, like I think it kind of showed too, like whenever we would had our, we would have our oral like examination with him, like, oh, like, like, so these are the things that I learned in your class, relating that to the things that I learned from the readings that you like showed me. So basically like running your knowledge, using those things to like connect everything and like show that to the professor. And that would like really, I feel like I'm not a professor, but I feel like it would really impress them. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think that was like my way of at least like reaching out to professors when I was a student. And I think just following up on that in terms of timing, uh, knowing that uh, professors get a lot of requests for letters of recommendation uh, and understanding that even if writing one might take X amount of time, there might be a, a queue of people who have requested at the same time, the earlier you can talk to them, and especially like, let's say you finished a, a class that you thought went really well, uh, you feel like, um, you know, you got sort of good close feedback on your work in that class, um, it is fine to ask for a letter of recommendation closer to that contact point when their memory is fresh rather than right before the application is due or even just planting the seed like I know I, I think I'm going to apply to grad school next year. I would like to ask you to be a reference. Um, would you be okay with that? Um, and then uh, if it were me, it might not be everyone, I might write draft, uh, have a draft in the back end where I've, I've written this early while I'm remembering the student's work and that connection. <laughs> Professor Sensei will remember this. Exactly. Um, that can be helpful, but that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you fall in love with a program last-ish minute. Uh, but I usually ask that students make an appointment in office hours with me so we can talk about their recent portfolio if it's been a while since I've taught them. What else have they been working on? What are their goals? Give me the specific things that I'm gonna write down on a sticky note that I can add to make that more personal uh, rather than more general. Um, and then at least two weeks, but a month is so much kinder. Um, and the kind of, I don't know, back and forth, like making sure that uh, things don't end up in spam folders. Like there's a lot of managing your recommenders in that way that makes that process easier. Um, but having the relationship up front, very important. Every once in a while, that third letter is really hard to get and you have to ask someone who doesn't know you as well, take the time to come to their office hours, remind them who you are and what you're about and what you like to make. That's some advice I have. MJ, do you have any follow-up on that general uh, sort of just technical getting letters, making this happen? Not so much. I can totally imagine for, for that it's going to be scary, and yeah. and just like I would say, just prepare yourself for that is probably step one. I think you know both Hezekiel and Chelsea were being pretty clear about that, um, and and um, some of my favorite letters that I read, and I kind of referenced this a little bit before, is the ones that do tell a story. Like I remember this time when, or. When working, and you mentioned independent studies, when working on this project in my lab, comma, right? Like as soon as you get those kind of things, like it immediately has more credibility. And um, I guess part of that is just like, do get engaged in those kind of things when you can. <laughs> and maybe I would imagine it wouldn't hurt when you do that visit to their office hours to remind them, hey, remember that time when? <laughs> Um, or, or, you know, I really enjoyed when I worked in your lab on that project in case they might have maybe forgotten something. So, you know, the, those, those things that, that personalize it, they might have to be reminded is probably, you know, you're not being pushy to remind them of things like that would be my feeling. Very good question. Chad, I know we're running low on time. We're going to run that poll soon. Is it okay to ask TAs for letters of recommendation? In general, I don't recommend that. But what I do recommend is when you reach out to, you could reach out to a TA and say, hey, I'm planning to ask Professor Swenson for a letter of recommendation for my work in 
oh, I don't know, 171 or 120, one of these big classes or ADI. Um, but I feel like I worked closely with you. Would you be willing to write a short reference for Professor Swenson of some of my specific accomplishments? Then the TA could reach out to me and say, hey, this is my observation of this student and why I think that they're well prepared for graduate school. And then in my letter, my letter will say, do, 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 do. And their TA who led their section closely had this to say about them. Suddenly that's that's material I can use. So you can, if you've got a TA who um, wants to support you in that way, it can uh, help a professor's letter be even more specific. Yeah, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, I hope everyone had, um, you know, got informed and enjoyed the program today. Um, yeah, and we'd love to go ahead and get everyone's feedback. So we have a post event poll here that I'm going to launch right now. And we'll just take about two minutes to fill that out. One thing while the poll's being filled out, I know there was one of these sessions earlier about building a portfolio website. Mm -hmm. And that's, at least for us, a huge, huge influencing factor on admissions and increasingly is a huge influencing factor on hiring it within the games world. Chelsea's nodding her head. <laughs> so um, yeah, do invest the time in that. Uh, it is time well spent. Uh, and I think that maybe one of these sessions about building a portfolio was probably recorded and available uh, for you to check out. Yeah, the um, I can actually expand on that a bit. Uh, the uh, portfolio workshop is we have there's a Canvas class um, set up with that, and so the recordings are within the Canvas class. And right now we're working on um, getting that um, where. Um, if a student goes to an advisor and asks for that, I think we'll be able to get them enrolled into the Canvas course um, where they can go back and watch all the recordings. I'll just go ahead and take uh, about another minute. I'll also say while stuff is digital right now, coming to office hours, like casually swinging by is harder than it ever has been. Um, and for faculty member that that don't necessarily keep their website updated with the current office hours schedule, uh, their email addresses should be available. And just because you are aren't in a class anymore with someone, or even if you've never had a class with someone, but they've got a, an expertise you're interested in, reach out via email and ask what, how they could access your office hours, uh, and they should be able to let you know that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close out the poll. Wonderful. All right, yeah, thank you everyone for filling out the poll. Um, on behalf of UC Santa Cruz, I'd like to thank you for joining this program. Um, I'd like to give a special shout out and thank you to our amazing panelists and Elizabeth for being here today um, and for taking the time to share their experiences with all of us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, have a wonderful Friday.